Thanks for the introduction and thank you for being here. I'm Feng Yuan Zhu. Today I will introduce my research work, Data Scatter, Efficiently Prototyping Large Scale or DNA Band Scatter Networks. This is a joint work with Yu Dafeng, Chen Ru Li, Xiao Hua Tian, and Xin Bing Wang from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Recent years, we have witnessed a rapid growth in the number of RVT devices. And this growth poses two challenges for RVT network. One is low power communication, and the other is connection capacity. For the first part, backscatter communication has been proved to be a promising technology that can achieve low power operation. For a backscatter tag, it only keeps the baseband part and offloads the carrier generation to the ambient environment or plug-in device. So it only consumes tensile microwatts. However, Early backscatter of tags cannot achieve long range operation or high data rate, mainly because of the cell severe interference from the exciting signal source. So researchers proposed frequency shifting to address this issue. The basic idea of frequency shifting is used a square wave to mix with the local bit stream and put the output to the impedance selection circuit. And this operation will make the band of the backscatter signal away from the band of the exciting signal and thus can reduce the interference from the exciting signal source. Now we take a look at the second challenge, connection capacity. Our previous work, OFDMA backscatter, had partially addressed this issue by assigning different data carriers to different tags by letting them perform in different frequency shifts. Since the framework is based on 802.11G protocol, so the total concurrency is also limited by the number of data carriers, that is 48. And this number can still not meet the requirements of the industry. So the question is, can we really extend this method to X concurrency? Because Wi-Fi have evolved to 118X protocol, which provides thousand levels of carriers. So hopefully our basket network can achieve 100 level and even 1000 level concurrency. If we follow 118X protocol, two things would happen. One is that we will get more frequency components in the network because they're in a single 20 megahertz band, the carrier spacing will be smaller. Another thing is that for each tag, Fine-grained frequency, frequency configuration is needed. However, if we continue to use the existing design, it will be extremely inefficient to realize such a network because existing work generates the square wave directly from the analog domain, that is the frequency synthesizer. And there are three problems about this design. First, multiple dividers need configuration to generate each output frequency. Second, multiple solutions exist for a single output frequency. Third, when we want to pick out one solution, there are multiple physical constraints that we need to take into account. As a result, this one-by-one -one configuration is laborious and inefficient. So can we find hardware alternatives to solve this problem? We surveyed the three types of programmable oscillators on linear technology, Silicon Labs, and Texas Instruments. And we find that these oscillators still cannot avoid the divider configuration. Another issue for the existing design is multi subcarrier modulation problem. We know that in an IoT network, some devices need a higher data rate than other devices. In OFDMA system, that means they need more data subcarriers than others. However, if it is inside, it uses the existing solution, then we need to modify the hardware to support more subcarriers, and it is really expensive. So the inside here is we cannot find a good resolution in the analog domain, so we turn to digital domain. In active radio, we mentioned that we can naturally generate multiple subcarriers 
without any divider settings. That is because we use the IFFT module. So the basic idea is to deploy IFFT on a wax scatter radio to address all these problems. But the problem is, can we achieve that? For active radio, the output of IFFT after some dig digital signal processing will be put to the DA conversion module. But basket radio doesn't have such a DAC. And the complex output digital samples of IFFT doesn't match with the impedance selection circuit of the analog domain. However, if we can tolerate some degrees of waveform distortion, we can add a binarization module at the end of the output of the digital domain and make a matching between the analog domain and digital domain. So the system now works, but we are still faced with two challenges. One is high resource consumption brought by the RFT. Here's an example. It is an open source burst Radix 2 endpoint FFT from Simulink. You can see that FPGA resource consumption in all access are very high. Another challenge is the high latency brought by the FFT calculation. You can see that when FFT points reach 1000, we need to wait for 6000 cycles before we can obtain the first output sample from the RFT calculation. To address these two challenges, we make an observation that for each tag, it only works in several subcarriers instead of all subcarriers. That means that we only have to calculate partial uh, IFFT and don't need to calculate the full IFFT. Second is that our output is binary, so we don't need to care about the scaling factor or anything related to the amplitude. So we make a revisit to the IDFT calculation and simplify the uh, calculation process. As a result, we find that we only need to determine the range of the normalized phase of the output. And we term this method as simplified IDFT. Now here is its performance. You can see that it can significantly reduce the power resource consumption and the most outstanding characteristic of this method is that it can reduce the latency to zero cycle. And this is extremely beneficial for our timing synchronization design in OFDMA system. So what does the spectrum look like? The transmitter sends a continuous wave at the center of the channel, just like an active radio. Each tag will have an IDFT module inside and it generates some carrier code to move it away from this uh, continuous wave. And the receiver will receive all this waveform and perform parallel decoding. We know that the receiver will naturally compress the center of the band, that is the DC component. So the interference from the transmitter is further reduced. Now we have IDFT module. Let's see how to achieve multi subcarrier modulation in one tag. We embed multiple IDFT units in software domain. And since the output is still binary, we need to vote for the final result. Here's an example. If there are more ones than zeros, the output will be one and vice versa. So the output, voting output of three subcarriers is shown as follows. If this code is put to the off switch, then the tag will simultaneously achieve the frequency shift of three data subcarriers with independent payloads. There's also an extra benefit for our design, that is dynamic spectrum allocation. In calculating dividing n operation, we will replace it by bit shifting to save more resources. And this parameter m can be broadcast in downlink commands. And why is it useful? Consider a scenario that when the network is full, 
and there are 64 subcarriers in total, and all of them are occupied. Then the new tech wants to join the network, but there is no vacant subcarrier for it. Now the transmitter only has to trans broadcast a new M equals to M plus 1 to let all techs know that uh, new frequency configuration is needed. And then all the techs will double the number of total subcarriers. As a result, existing tags will be moved to the left side of the spectrum, and the all the right side of the spectrum will be vacant. And now the new tag can conveniently accommodate itself. There are also some commonly shared problems by all of DME systems that we need to address. First is timing synchronization problem. In DigiScatter, we have to synchronize all tags by the transmitter. And the transmitter will send a series of triggering sequences modulated by OOK. Now we use this multiple triggering scheme to increase the chance of successful triggering to allow more tags to simultaneously work. Another problem is phase offsets. In this scatter, we follow a three-step procedure to address all phase problems. Step one is CFO correction. Step two is equalization, which will also recover the initial, initial phase of each tag. And step three, since we have no pilot tones in this network, we have to dynamically check the ch phase changes. So we use decision-directed PLL algorithm for the decoding. Now let's see the evaluation part. We scatter 100 tags in the meeting room, which size is 5 meters by 7 meters. And the left side, we can see that the system in runtime, all tags can successfully work. Here's a demo video for this scenario in 2.4 gigahertz band. This is DigiScatter Network. This network uses OFDMA and can support parallel communication of hundreds of backscatter devices in a single Wi-Fi channel. This is the transmitter. It sends OOK modulated downlink commands and continuous wave for backscatter devices. This is the receiver. It captures wireless signal and sends the laptop through a cable. These are backscatter devices. Each of them is made of a PCB, a FPGA board and a battery. They are uploading the bitstream stored in their memory. The entire network mainly consists of a ThinkPad laptop, two warp SDRs and 70 backscatter tags. Now we present the DigiScatter Network Monitor, a graphical user interface which provides convenient access to network conditions. Right text box presents current devices in the network. Now we specify the network parameter. First, we choose the physical layer data rate as the object. Then we can either choose a tag or a subcarrier. Finally, we specify the number of subcarriers. We begin monitoring, and now the monitor would collect real-time data based on the parameters that we chose. The output would update every a few seconds. We can switch to link layer data rate. And bed error rate. When ambient noise is not too high, the BER would decrease to zero. Now we take a look at current signal to noise ratio. It shows that backscatter signal can be below the noise floor from time to time. We can also directly present the spectrum to give more details. Yellow means high power density, and blue means low power density. Each yellow vertical line indicates that a tag occupies this subcarrier. We can switch to another subcarrier to continue monitoring. Thanks for watching. That's all for the demo video. Now we take a look at the beam level examination of all tags in two test beds. 
One test bed is, contains 100 text in 2.4 gigahertz. Another test bed contains 300 text in 900 megahertz. And the horizontal axis indicates the subcarrier index of each tag. And the vertical axis represents five data rates. And that is all for my talk. Thanks for listening.